Um, will you t please turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 1, Galatians, chapter 1. Last week, uh, we were blessed with being able to start this brand new study in this little epistle, and we almost made it through the first chapter. Uh, you may remember that the Apostle Paul had uh, visited the territory or the province um, of Galatia, and he did bring in the good news of Jesus Christ there. Paul had preached the gospel uh, to the Gentiles, and the result was that these Gentile men and women had begun to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Paul had founded several uh, of the churches there in Galatia, and as we've seen in verse 2 of chapter 1, um, that's who this little epistle is addressed to, to the churches in Galatia. What had happened was, as soon as Paul had uh, left Galatia to continue on his journey, uh, a group of guys called Judaizers had begun creeping into the church, and what they were doing was they were leading these brand new Christians astray. You see, the gospel message is that Jesus willingly went to the cross at Calvary and he died a sinner's death in order to pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus was God's free gift of salvation to us sinners and we're saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus. And that's it. God's grace through faith in Christ. Okay? We become justified just as if we never sinned by faith in Christ alone. Our salvation is by faith in Christ alone, okay? We're put in that right standing, that right relationship with God by faith in Christ alone, okay? Well, these Judaizers came in after Paul left the territory and they began to preach a different gospel. Uh, but it was no gospel at all. Um, it was just a different message, okay? They were telling these new Gentile Christians that, hey, if you truly want to be justified, if you want to be saved, declared righteous by God, well, basically you need to become a Jew first. All right? They taught things like you needed to be circumcised, okay? Eat kosher, obey the Torah, the law. Then you'll be justified. Then you'll be truly saved. But when we begin to mix legalism and works into Christianity, what really happens is we start messing with God's grace. You see, by God's grace, we can receive his free gift of salvation through faith in Christ. But when you say, also, you need to do this and you need to do that, then what does that do to God's grace? Well, you begin to remove it from yourself, okay? Okay. Not only were their Judaizers leading the new Christians astray with false teachings, but they were also attacking Paul personally. They told the new believers that, well, Paul wasn't even a real apostle. They told the new believers that he didn't walk with Jesus like the other apostles did. Therefore, he really has no authority as an apostle. They also claimed that the gospel message that Paul shared with them was nothing more than really him just regurgitating what was taught to him by men. And so in the first chapter so far, we've witnessed Paul, you know, really start setting the record straight on this stuff and, and address these things right out of the gate. You may remember he started out by introducing himself and his title or his position, right? He says in the very first verse, Paul, an apostle, not from men or through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And so right away, establishing his apostleship, the fact that he wasn't an apostle by men or through men, but by Christ himself and God the Father. Then in verse 6, we saw Paul state his reason for writing this epistle. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Okay? You see, by turning away from the false gospel to the false gospel of the Judaizers, Paul says what they're really doing is turning away from God and turning away from God's grace. Actually, in this same epistle, in the fifth chapter in verse 4, this is what Paul says. Paul says, 
He says, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. You see, the Judaizers were leading them back into that bondage that is the law. Trying to earn justification, trying to earn that righteousness through works of the flesh. Paul tells us that this in return is alienating them or separating them okay, from Christ. And they've fallen away from grace. And so you think about those two things. Alienated from Christ and falling away from God's grace. And so you can see the severity of this and how this was a very much a top tier issue that was going on. Next, in verses 8 through 9, we saw Paul defend the gospel. Not only did he warn the new Christians that anyone, even an angel of God, who preached a different gospel other than the one that he brought to them, well, be accursed. Or destined to destruction. And in verse 11, Paul defends the way he received the gospel message. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by the revelation from Jesus Christ. The revelation of Christ. Speaking about Paul's conversion to Christianity on the road to Damascus when the risen Lord appeared to him. And so again, the whole first chapter uh, so far has really been Paul setting that record straight, defending his apostleship, defending his authority as an apostle, and defending the gospel and how it was given to him through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so now that you know our minds are refreshed as to what's going on, let's go ahead and continue on where we left off last week. That would be verse 18 so Galatians chapter 1, verses 18 through 24, Paul says this. Actually, we'll just go to 20. But Paul says this. He says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. And so what's Paul saying here? He's saying, look, these Judaizers are claiming that my gospel and my ministry came from men and not God. Well, I didn't rush straight to Jerusalem to be taught by the leaders of Christianity. Okay? Remember, the birth of the church was there in Jerusalem. Pentecost, right? Well, that's where John, James, Peter, that's where they were. And Paul says, you know, after Damascus, I waited three years before I even went to Jerusalem. Then he points out that when he did finally go there, he was only with Peter for 15 days. Okay, and he didn't see any of the other apostles except James, Jesus' brother. Actually, one of the main reasons we're told that Paul didn't see any of the other apostles is given to us in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 26 through 28. And it says this, it says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So remember, Saul was a persecutor of the church. And he's going to touch on that in a minute, but this would be like, like Hitler trying to go and worship in a synagogue. Okay? I mean... Christians were afraid. They were afraid of Saul. And the apostles were skeptical of Paul at first. And so why does Paul bring this up to the Galatians? Well, to further prove that his gospel and his ministry didn't come from the apostles or the church. Not only did he spend no time with the apostles, as we learned, but at this time they were still leery of Paul being a Christian at all. How could his message and his ministry be from men he spent no time with and men that wanted nothing to do with him? Okay, and so you see why Paul's telling us these things. Paul continues on giving an account, and he says in verse 21, 
afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So this would include Tarsus, Paul's hometown. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. You see, Paul's saying, look, the churches in Judea, they, they've never even seen my face. They don't even know what I look like. But I really love verses 23 and especially 24, and here's why. I'd like to read to you out of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And uh, these are actually the first verses that I learned um, as a brand new Christian. Um, but writing to young pastor Timothy, Paul says this. He says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in, in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see in those verses, what Paul was saying is he was a blasphemer of Christ. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was an insolent or a violent man. And when it came to being a sinner, Paul says, man, I was the chief. I was the worst. I was the worst there is of sinners. Guys, Paul had no problem dragging you outside and stoning you to death in front of your family for following Christ. That's what Paul's speaking of in verse 23 of our text in Galatians when he says, but they were hearing only Paul who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. There's something special about those verses. Especially, you know, when I look back at my own life, um, my own conversion, and I bet for a lot of you here and a lot of you watching at home, uh, you can relate to these verses as well. I'm not going to get into my testimony or nothing, you know, but most of you know I was saved by God's grace through faith in Christ when I was in my early 30s. And I was not really a good person, guys. Um, everything Paul mentioned in those verses in Timothy, I can check off my own list. You know, blasphemer, check. Violent, check. Chief of sinners, check. You know, very worldly, very sinful lifestyle. And my friends and my family knew me by those sins. You know, that sinful life that I lived. People knew me my whole life that way. And so what do you think happens when one of those people who know me from the past sees me on YouTube teaching the Bible? <laughs> teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what happens. Verse 24. And they glorified God in me. You see... Not only do my Christian friends and family glorify God because of what God has done to change me from who I was, but my old friends and family glorify God because they know that the change that they've seen in me ain't me. It's God. I bet a lot of you can relate to that. You know, people who knew you back in the day and look at your life now. And they say, wow, you know, God, God really got a hold of him or God got a hold of her. That glorifies God. 
And it's by the change they've seen in our lives, that transformation that's taken place in our lives by the grace of God. I mean, how many of you used to be alcoholics, but God delivered you from that? And people who knew you as an alcoholic look at you now and go, wow. How many of you sisters out there, you know, used to have a knucklehead husband and prayed and prayed for that fool? <laughs> and one day he accepted Christ, and here we are years later, and you look before you and you see a godly man now. And you go, man, glorify Christ, glorify God in that, right? And so I think we can all relate, you know, to this in one way or the other. But how neat that the worst of sinners, Saul of Tarsus, tells us they knew who I used to be, but they're seeing who I am now. Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, preaching the faith that I tried to destroy, and they're glorifying God in him. Really neat. And what a great way to end chapter 1. So let's move into chapter 2 now, see what's next. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. And so we see in these verses, Paul here introduces us to a couple new brothers in Christ. The first one being Barnabas. Okay, So Acts chapter 4.36 tells us a few things about Barnabas. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And so Barnabas is actually called Joseph. We're told he's a Jew, and he's from the priestly tribe of Levi. And his name means son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas was. He was an encourager. We always need Barnabases. Actually, whenever you read about Barnabas in the Bible, you will notice that he's always encouraging someone. Always helping someone. Not only was Barnabas one of Paul's closest friends, but Barnabas was the one who introduced Paul to the other apostles who were in Jerusalem. And it was Barnabas that went with Paul on his first missionary trip. And so Paul and Barnabas ministered and served the Lord together for, for quite some time. And then we're told in verse 1 that after 14 years, that is 14 years after the road to Damascus, Paul went up to Jerusalem with, with Barnabas and another young man by the name of Titus. Okay, so Titus, he's uh, it, the book Titus in your Bible. is written by Paul to this man right here. Titus was like a young pastor Timothy um, in the fact that they were both uh, Paul's protégés. Okay, um, they were both young men. Where they differed, however, was uh, that Timothy was from a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, a Greek. And Titus was a straight-up Gentile, okay? Greek parents, not Jewish at all. But we're told that Paul, Barnabas, and Titus, Titus went up to Jerusalem, and he went up to Jerusalem by revelation, okay? That's what verse 2 says. In other words, God put it on Paul's heart. God revealed to Paul through the Holy Spirit that he wanted him to go to Jerusalem, and it was there in Jerusalem that the Apostle Paul reported to the leaders the gospel that he had been preaching to the Gentiles. The gospel he preached to the Gentiles during his first missionary trip and how the Gentiles had received Christ as their Lord and Savior. Actually, the very things Paul's talking about in our text here can be found also in the book of Acts chapter 15. And it's referred to as the Jerusalem Council. I would encourage you guys to take a few minutes um, sometime and read Acts chapter 15 um, to get a better understanding of what's going on here. But as we go through these verses in Galatians, I want to parallel them with some verses out of the book of Acts. And so, for example, 
In Galatians, we just learned Paul, Barnabas, and Titus went to Jerusalem. And Paul there spoke with the leaders of the church. So let me read now out of Acts 15, verses 1 through 5, and it will give us a better understanding of what we're being told in Galatians, why they went to Jerusalem. And so in Acts chapter 15, it says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them, Titus, go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. And so being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all the things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so you see the issue at hand. The Judaizers were demanding the Gentiles be circumcised in order to be saved. But look at verse 3 and 4 with me now. Paul says, yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. See, by this time, Titus was well known as being a part of the way that is a Christian. Titus preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Titus was a Gentile who was not circumcised. And so this was another slap in the face to those who were saying Gentiles need to be circumcised to be saved. Paul's saying, look at Titus. You know that dude's saved. He's not circumcised. Titus was an example. Now, speaking of this demand by the false teachers to be circumcised, Paul tells us why in verse 4. Take a look with me. It says, And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty or our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And so we learn some things about the false teachers here that were attacking Paul's apostolic authority and the gospel he shared. First, we see that they are false brethren who were secretly brought in. <coughs> Excuse me. In other words, these men weren't saved. They weren't Christians whatsoever. They were false brethren. Okay? That's what Satan does today, guys. He'll send someone into the church secretly, undercover, or like Paul says, by stealth. Secondly, we see that they came in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. You see, guys, when Jesus went to the cross, he did away with the law. At the cross, Christ made a new covenant. No longer are Christians bound by the law. And that's a great thing because no one could ever keep it. If you broke one, you were guilty of them all. But when Jesus came, he put to death the law. The law could never save anyone. Actually, it did quite the opposite. It condemned everyone. The law is like a mirror. You look into it, and the reflection you see is a guilty sinner sentenced to eternal death. That's what the law is. It's good, but we can't keep it. But in Christ, we have freedom. We're not under the law. We're under his marvelous grace. 
We're under the grace of God. And so these Judaizers come to spy out this freedom that we have in Christ. And thirdly, we see their goal was that they might bring us back into bondage. That's what it says at the end of verse 4. Their goal was to bring them back into the bondage under the law. The law of Moses, circumcision, clean, unclean, the rituals, all of it. Okay? But here's the thing. If, if you had to go through all these works to be saved, then why did Christ go to the cross? I mean, if we can earn our salvation by keeping the law, then Jesus went to the cross and died for nothing. Jesus went to the cross because it was impossible for us to save ourselves. And so to say there's something we must do to be saved means that the Son of God died in vain. One of the glorious things about being a Christian, guys, is the freedom we have in Christ. Again, no longer under the bondage of the law. We don't have to try to earn our way to heaven by being perfect. Our sins, past, present, future have been paid in full, forgiven because of what Christ did by God's grace. But just because we're free men and free women in Christ, we must remember to never, ever take advantage of God's grace. Never take advantage of our freedom and liberty in Christ. It's not a license to sin. Actually, in the first two verses of Romans chapter 6, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? We see in verse 5, in regards to the Judaizers that came in by stealth to drag free Christians back into bondage, Paul says, To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul says we didn't buy into this for one second. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you, and you, and you, and me, and you at home. And thank the Lord that Paul was such a soldier for Christ, that he endured hardship, that he stood his ground, that he didn't yield or compromise when it came to these Judaizers. Could you imagine if he did give in? If he decided to stand back and let these men teach salvation through works, salvation through circumcision, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. But Paul was faithful to the Lord, and because of his faithfulness to God, we can stand here tonight and read the truth. All right, take a look at verse 6 with me. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. And I like Paul. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. I know that's kind of tricky the way it's worded. But who's Paul talking about here? He's talking about the church leaders. Believe it or not. He says, those who seemed to be something. Now, even though Paul respected them, Paul said, it didn't make any difference to me. God doesn't show favoritism. These leaders added nothing to me, is what Paul's saying. In other words, they preached the same message as me. They didn't teach him anything new. But I like that, how Paul reminds us that God shows personal favoritism to no man. Because it's interesting, isn't it? You know how sometimes we can think that God favors someone more than the other. You know, like maybe this person only sins like five times a week and I sin five times an hour. 
you know, so God must love them more than me, you know. <laughs> or this guy's a leader in the church, so God listens to his prayers more than mine. Maybe if I ask him to pray for me, God will come through, you know. It's interesting how we can get those kind of ideas. But Paul lays it out for us. God shows no personal favoritism to no man. In other words, God loves you just as much as he loves Pastor Gary. God loves you just as much as he loved Pastor Chuck Smith. Okay? Billy Graham. God hears your prayers just as much as he does theirs. And I think that's a good thing for us to remember, that all of God's children are equally precious to him. Okay? His love is the same for each one of us. He gave his son for each one of us equally. And so don't ever feel like God favors another brother or sister more than you because God shows favoritism to no man. All right? We're equal in the eyes of God. He loves us all equally. He hears us all equally. Okay? And so Paul says, these guys added nothing to me. And he's not saying it in an insulting or a belittling uh, way. But what he's saying is they possess the same thing. It's like if I got a $5 bill and you got a $5 bill and I say, hey, let's trade. What did I gain? We still have a $5 bill, right? That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I didn't get nothing from them. It's not like they have a better gospel, okay? Or their apostleship or whatever is superior, you know? We're the same. All right, let's take a look at our last verses of the evening, and then we'll wrap it up. Verse 7. He says, But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised has been committed to me, just as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he, that is Jesus, who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James... Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. And so Paul here is describing more of that scene that took place at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. But it's really neat what we see in these verses. Paul had just spoken about how God shows no favoritism among men. And here we see God call different men to different ministries. First off, for any new Christians who don't know yet, um, when the Bible speaks of circumcised, or the circumcision, it's referring to Jews, Jewish people, okay? When you read about the uncircumcised in the Bible, it's speaking about Gentiles, okay? In this time, there were two groups in the world. You were either a Jew, or you were not a Jew, which is a Gentile, all right? And so what Paul is telling us here is that the gospel message was given by Christ to Peter for the circumcised, so the Jews. The same gospel message was given by Christ to Paul for the Gentiles, the uncircumcised. Now that doesn't mean that Paul only shared the gospel with Gentiles, but his ministry was for the Gentiles. Okay? And Paul tells us in verse 9 that these men who seem to be pillars in the church, that's James, Peter, and John, these three guys, they were the pillars that held up the early church. Paul says, when me and Barnabas went there and shared with them the gospel that we've been sharing with the Gentiles, and we told them of my meeting Christ on the road to Damascus, they gave us the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they recognized Paul as a true apostle, and they recognized the same Jesus that gave them their gospel was the same Christ that gave it to Paul. Paul. 
Now, in closing, I just want to point out one thing, one last thing. Paul, in defending his apostleship and the gospel that he preached, in this letter to the churches of Galatia, had just described to us a scene where there was a lot of opportunity for division among the church, division among the brethren. You had men who had been placed in different ministries, okay? This guy was to preach to Jews. This guy was to preach to Gentiles. These guys walked with Jesus. This guy persecuted people that followed Jesus. This guy was converted on the road to Damascus. I mean, there was all this mix going on. And then to top it off, you had false teachers coming in and spreading heresies and lies and things like that. A lot of opportunity for division. But what we just saw in these last verses was these men recognized the anointing they each had. They recognized that even though they had been called to different things, even though they had been called to different ministries, even though they came from different backgrounds, they served the same Lord. And they recognized that they all preached the same gospel. And so as a team, they continued on with what the Lord had called them to do. And they encouraged each other to continue in the service of preaching the gospel. And so it should always be with the church today, guys. May we always understand the same Jesus called us to different positions in the body of Christ. But we're one in Jesus. And may we always remember that even though we all come from different backgrounds, we all have the same Lord and we share the same gospel. Amen? All right, let's pray. And so, Father God, we...